can hear me? Is it clear? Is it good? Cool. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming to my, my talk. <coughs> so my name is Jason Thomas, and I will be talking about Haskell and how it's similar to Ruby on Rails. Uh, in my day job, I do a lot of Ruby on Rails. Um, I don't get to do a lot of Haskell, which makes me a bit sad. Um, is everyone here familiar with Haskell? Yeah, great. A few people. Um, so you really like Lambda Calculus and Monads and, and yeah? I don't. I, <laughs> sorry. I, ha I have no idea how any of that stuff works. I'm clueless. Like, Haskell is a language that a lot of people seem to think is some rite of passage to programming. Like, if you can handle Haskell, then you can handle anything. You're the master. You really know your stuff. Um, and it's, it's very academic to some people, and it's all about mathematics to some people. Uh, my maths qualifications? Questionable. Uh, you know, high school, I was drunk and passed out on my maths exam, so I failed. But still, I build stuff that works in Haskell. And we're here because we build stuff, right? So I won't be talking about monads or about algebra or category theory, because I don't, I don't know about any of that. Um, I won't be using the phrase, it's easier to reason about. I think if you've seen a functional programming talk before, everyone uses this phrase. It's so cliche. I think, uh, I think there should be like a big swear jar that anytime someone says, it's easier to reason about, you just throw some money in. And maybe I should like patent that, that phrase, like get royalties. And here's my general uh, disclaimer. I have no idea what I'm doing in Haskell either. But my sort of wishful thinking around that topic is that uh, the language is so smart that it will sort of protect me from myself and from the stupid mistakes that I make. Um, and just to be clear, just because I'm on stage and you're my audience doesn't mean I'm the expert. I'm really not a Haskell expert. If you were like expecting a Haskell expert, I'm sorry. Don't be mad. I brought this dog so you wouldn't be mad. <laughs> Uh, okay, so here's, here's the why, here's the motivation behind why I work with Haskell um, when I'm not doing my day job, or you know, when I'm doing my day job, but shh, don't tell them. Um, I started as a front-end guy, like, like a lot of people, I started with like HTML and CSS and JavaScript and PHP, and I started to build things as best I could. Um, I started to build what business people would tell me to build, and I'd try and fit their requirements, but I wouldn't always understand their requirements because business people and developers don't communicate so well, and we, we all know this. So a lot of the time, my software would have to change, and we all know that like, as you change software, you have to like, refactor it, and then gradually it gets broken. Um, I'm quite pleased to be at this conference, actually, because a few years ago, I was at a Greg Young talk, and he said, uh, you know, most developers, they think they are refactoring, but actually they're refactoring, because they don't have, like, tests in place, and they break the software as they change it. Um, I got a bit tired of, of maintaining stuff that I'd already written. Like, I don't, I don't, coding's not super fun to me. I'd rather, like, ship a product and make some people happy. So um, I got into this whole, software craftsmanship thing. So, ah, okay, if, if I write lots of tests and I'm really rigorous about my software development and I really focus on naming and, and I digested all these ideas from um, Joe Rainsberger and from Uncle Bob and from some of the people here at the conference, and I think I've watched Gary Bernhardt's Destroy All Software Screencast series about five times. Um, I got really into being rigorous and disciplined and taking pride in my own code. And then I went to another Greg Young talk. He's here? I don't know. I went to another Greg Young talk where he said, uh, maybe if you didn't make things so complicated, you wouldn't have to write so many tests. And that was an eye-opener for me. Like, maybe I'm writing too many tests. So I got pretty good at writing isolated tests. Um, but my software would still fail from time to time because as rigorous as you, as you can be, you can only write tests to catch the mistakes that you think you're going to make. You can't like know what you don't know to be a bit meta about it. So 
at some point I thought, this is not working. I, I would rather be lazy and let the system work for me because the whole software craftsmanship thing, it puts the onus on the developer to be rigorous. And I don't think people are rigorous and disciplined naturally. Machines are, so we should like offload that stuff onto the machine. So that's pretty much the why. Okay, um, so it's about Haskell, and this is timed really nicely because Dylan's talk previous to mine was like, don't use a framework, and now I'm like, do use a framework. Um, Haskell has, it's, even though it's not mainstream, it has a bunch of frameworks that are mature and really stable. Um, some of them are analogous to frameworks that you probably have heard of in like Python or Ruby. Uh, there's one called Scotty, which is a really nerdy Star Trek reference, and that's analogous to Ruby Sinatra. Ruby's a bit cooler, like hipster cool. Um, this is the framework that I use. <laughs> Sorry, that's the guy that wrote the framework that I use. They're not really into marketing in the Haskell world. Like, they're just happy to have their language and work with it and not be worried about selling it to people. Like, Ruby's all about sales, and Haskell... I couldn't find a logo for the, the framework. I just used him. So his name's Michael Snoyman. His not, name's not Yasod. It's the name of the framework. That's the guy. Um, this is slightly a uh, tenuous part of the talk, um, because you probably can't see the figures from there, and it's not really important either, but any time I get into a sort of war of the languages at any dinner party with other developers, or any, you know, go to the bar with some developers, you start getting into discussions about what you should use to write software, and um, maybe I'll be on a team who's, with people who are writing PHP, and someone will say, yeah, PHP sucks, let's use Ruby. And then someone says, oh, but Ruby's too slow. And then someone else says, well, it's fast enough. What does slow mean? And someone says, well, we should use JavaScript for everything because it's faster. Um, and then I'll say, well, do you know how fast Haskell is? No. Does, you know, I don't think it matters because I have two sets of figures here. On the left is like one machine. On the right is a different machine. It's an EC2 machine. Um, and the figures are like, they, they vary really, really wildly. So, I mean, the point is that performance figures don't matter that much. But if you're into performance figures, if that sort of excites you, and it, it I sort of have to use it to sell the language a bit more. Um, at the bottom, right at the bottom, there's Django, and I think it's roughly the same speed as uh, Ruby on Rails. Uh, these are all measured in requests per second. So it's just like someone uh, sends a request to the server, and like a ping request, and the server pongs a, serve, a response back. And on this one machine, um, Django and also Rails do about 2,500 uh, requests per second. Um, Node.js is faster, as people say it's, it's much faster, and it is quite a bit faster. It'll do just over 11,000 requests per second. Um, but then you look at stuff like Haskell, and it's doing just over 80,000 requests per second. Um, and that's, I, th I think that's a lot to do with um, the way the language is designed. You can't really do anything that's blocking, right? So when you're starting a Rails project, you, you worry about scalability, and you worry about like, oh, everything that might take some time, I have to stick it in a background job in case it like blocks. I don't want it to be slow. You have to worry about scalability. It's really comforting to me to know that um, with Haskell, I sort of just get that speed for free. I don't have to think about scalability so much. Um, and with any new sort of startup project, maybe the scalability problem will be offset long enough that the business will just go bankrupt before I have to you know, get more service. Cool. So um, when people are getting started with Haskell, or when they're trying to get started with web application development in Haskell, I think one of the first hurdles they experience is um, how do you like ship the stuff? How do you share it with people? Because there are a lot of people talking about Haskell and saying, oh, this is how you solve Fibonacci. This is how you do prime numbers. And you go, oh, I don't, who cares? How can you make money with that? You can't. You need to like ship stuff and present a product to people so they can like pay you for it. Um, and I've tried a bunch of solutions out there. There are many. Um, I've tried lots of them, and um, none of them worked for me except for this one. Um, this is Nix OS. It's um, 
it builds itself as a declarative, purely functional Linux distribution. And it's sort of, um, it's not just that, it's a bit of an ecosystem. It's Nix OS is a Linux dist distribution, and Nix that goes with it is a package manager, which is purely functional. And that just means that um, when you install a package on your system, it doesn't overwrite anything. It installs different versions of the same dependency side by side, so you never like overwrite stuff and possibly put your system in a failed state. So it's sort of stateless as well, which means rollback's really easy, because if you make a mistake, you can just roll back. And NixOS is the same idea. Um, you don't have your system state littered around in different files. So this like sysadmin job that some people have, I don't think you need it so much in this. I'm not a sysadmin, but I do this kind of stuff with this technology, because it's really easy. You have one central config file, and then NixOS just builds the system to reflect what you've defined in the one config file. So I don't have to learn much, and I don't really want to learn much around sysadmin. I'd rather just build product. Um, this slide just has some code in it, as you can see. Um, there'll be gradually more and more code as we go along. It's not uh, so important exactly to be able to read this. Like, don't bother taking notes. If you want to go through this, I have a really detailed article on my blog you can look at later. Um, but it is worth saying that installing Nix, the package manager, takes like 30 seconds on, on my machine with my crappy uh, internet connection at home. Um, you just curl their install script into your shell. Um, maybe some security people here might cringe at that, but it's the way it's done. Um, and then you do some plumbing and you install some other like Haskell-y tool things, like um, this Cabal to Nix tool that takes a, a Haskell Cabal file, and Cabal is like Haskell's project management tool and also um, dependency management tool. Um, it takes a Cabal file and turns it into a Nix expression. So that's the sort of transition point between the Haskell world and the Nix world. Because we're, we're writing Haskell and we're deploying it to Nix OS, right? And then I also um, install like a G GHC, which is the Glasgow Haskell compiler, because you have to compile your stuff. Um, and the Yasod bin, which just like scaffolds your new site. It's like saying Rails new. Um, you'd say stack new Yasod, whatever. I don't know. And then while you're uh, developing, I don't know how many people have actually tried Haskell development before with Cabal. Um, but there's this well-known thing called Cabal Hell, and that's where like different versions of your dependencies don't work together. And then if you make a mistake, um, your system's in a failed state, and you have to like throw the whole thing out and start from scratch, and it's really, really painful. But NixOS sort of gets rid of that problem because everything's separated, so you can't put your machine in a failed state. Um, and when I work with stuff in Haskell, I will use this Cabal to Nix tool to create um, a sort of isolated shell environment. So I will do my work in the terminal. I don't know how this works outside of the terminal. Sorry. Um, so that first line creates the, um, the environment. The second line puts you into it, so you get this new prompt. And um, the third line is to do a similar kind of thing, but it, just, it makes an application sort of expression for Nix, which you need for deployment later. You don't have to understand what that means. Um, are there any questions at this point? Am I, or is it fairly clear? It's clear? Yeah. Excellent. Um, OK. Are there, are there Rails developers here? Who does Rails? You do Rails? One does Rails. One happy person in the room. Uh, there's a really good Rails book. Um, I think it's just called The Rails Tutorial by Michael Hartle. It's, you can read it for free online. Um, and what I really like, or one thing that I really like about that book, um, despite it being free, uh, is that one of the first things you do, rather than building an application, one of the first things you do is deploy the system somewhere. So like straight away, you can share your hello world with your friends. It's really gratifying having a product that you can like use and show to people. Um, I think this is super important, and I think if you develop stuff in isolation, 
um, then there's a good chance it'll never be released. It just exists in a vacuum, and then it's good for nothing. Um, so what I suggest you do is straight away use this tool called the Nix Ops, which is part of the Nix ecosystem. And Nix Ops, um, again, is declarative. And basically, you tell it how your um, server infrastructure should look. It's super simple. In my case, I just say, well, I want one EC2 instance on Amazon. And it'll run my web application and Postgres and Tarsnap for backups. And NixOps will um, SSH into Amazon for me. And then um, if there isn't already a server running, it'll spin one up for me. And then it'll build all my stuff and deploy it for me. So I don't have to be a DevOps guy. I don't have to learn any of that. It's all done for free. It's really nice. But I don't want to learn this stuff. So, so getting that going is a simple